up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. I have a few verses I'd like to read, starting with verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. I'm going to speak to you this morning a sermon that I've titled, God's Priorities, A Healthy Church Reflects the Glory of God. God's Priorities, A Healthy Church Reflects the Glory of God. 1 Peter 3, 13, Who is he who will harm you if you follow that which is good? Someone say, Amen. But even if you suffer for the sake of righteousness... You are blessed. Do not be afraid of their terror. Do not be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to every man who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and fear. Have a good conscience so that evildoers will speak evil of you and falsely accuse you, good, accuse your good conduct in Christ, may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, that you suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. In this Christian walk, we are faced many times with tough calls. What can we do and how can we decide what to do? How is it that we can cope with the things that are going on around us, even personal issues, those things that trouble us and make us struggle? In tough times, calls sometimes we feel the need to compromise our faith. When there are tough times, we feel the the need to compromise sometimes. My friends, I don't know about you, but I'm faced with conflict often. (laughs) Seems like over the last two years, practically on a daily basis. When I am faced with people who are in a sinful lifestyle, or I see people doing things that need correction, and I know that I must confront behaviors, there is an eternal conflict that goes on within me. Part of me says, just let it go. Who hears what I'm saying? Part of me just says, just let, why be confrontational? Just let it go. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, but you're the pastor. I've given you instruction on how to be the person that can confront with a gentle spirit and a fear of respect and honor that says, but for the grace of God, There I be also. Can someone say amen? Amen. But still, even when faced with internal conflict, I have to say to these folks in a loving manner that what they are doing is wrong in God's eyes. Turn from it. Make yourself pure. My concern is for the spiritual health of all the people that make Angle Lake Neighborhood Church their home, and they are sure that God's Word is correct, and that I give it to them in a way that they can understand it and have them be in a proper relationship with God. I'm always amazed at when people demand that I fix something. And most of the time they ask me to fix something, it's a, it's a heart condition on their part. That I can't begin to fix. Who knows a pastor can't fix heart conditions. I'm glad I got at least one amen. Thank you Mike. I appreciate that. Again. There's conflict in my spirit. My, my heart starts to try and find ways to make everyone happy. Can I get an amen? There's a part of me that wants to make everybody happy. But how many of you know that in the process of trying to make everybody happy. You actually make no one happy but I know that it is something that I will never be able to accomplish in trying to make everyone happy 
We must all ask God to come and judge our hearts. Your pastor has to stand before the mirror every day and say, God, come and judge my heart. Help me to see the things that I am doing that need changing. Anybody else doing that or is it just me? I stand before God every day and say, Lord, help me. Judge my heart. See if there's anything in me that needs changing. And Lord God, I pray that you begin to change me by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's benefit in changed behavior. <laughs> if you're here this morning and you have felt intimidated or put down <coughs> by a boss, your peers, your co-workers, or your finances, did you know that your finances can intimidate you? Think about that for a minute. If you look in the mirror every morning, you say, I need a vacation, God! And I need one now. I find myself some mornings wondering if I need a vacation. Then let me ask you this question. Where, where are our priorities? Where are the things that are important to us? And listen, a vacation may be very important. And God, I think God wants us to have a vacation. But let us be careful on why I need the vacation. Whether we consciously think about it or not, we all live according to priorities. A priority is that which is of first importance. When we speak of priorities, we mean those things that we place a higher value on and attempt to attain or fulfill in the course of our daily decisions and activities. I am always amazed at the person who might say in their private life that they believe one way, but in their public life they believe another. I don't understand that. Very simply, let me just say, and this is not political, but I want you to grab hold of this. A politician to stand up and say that they personally don't believe in abortion, but they vote for it is a double-minded person. You can't be one thing in your private life and another in your public life. It's just not possible. It just sounds like a double-minded person to me. My friends, for the Christ follower, there should only be one person. And it's him or her who lives out their lives both privately and publicly for Jesus Christ. And they follow his word to the best of their ability. Can I get an amen? The problem is many go through life with the wrong priorities. Many set their priorities to have money, success, Comfort, a good name, fame, and a reputation. And there is nothing wrong with any of those things. But if I set my life out to achieve those things above everything else, I'm probably not going to achieve anything at all. It was reported that when the Titanic sank, there were 11 millionaires on the boat. Now, that may not seem like a great statistic today when practically everybody's a millionaire, right? But when the Titanic sank, being a millionaire meant a great deal of money. There was one man who survived who told reporters that he left $300,000 in money, jewelry, and his securities in a box in his cabin. He said when the boat was sinking, it seemed like a mockery to be worried about my money. He said, instead of going to the safe and trying to get my money, I picked up three oranges instead. How many of you know if you're on a sinking boat, three oranges is probably a fortune? When faced with certain, with certain circumstances, we can see clearly what truly is important in life and what is not. So I guess the question for us this morning is, how can we get our priorities right from the start Instead of waiting for some kind of wake-up call. So this morning I want to ask us, or this morning let us ask ourselves, what are God's priorities for our lives? So if you're taking notes, the first priority is, or the first thing we need to do is, get real. Can we get real for a few minutes? Can we just talk about life for a few minutes? Can we take some time to discover what's really important? I think the first thing we have to do is we have to admit that there are problems living here on the earth. Anybody here have any problems? Or is, it just, is it just me? 
<laughs> I want you to listen very carefully. You can do everything perfectly. You can do everything with good intentions. You can do everything with a righteous heart. You can try everything within your power to make sure everything works out just right. And you can still have problems. Sometimes life is just painful, hurtful, and stressful. 1 Peter 1, 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even now, if for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. Peter knew the pressures the first century church faced, and he talked about them. We can expect to face the same pressures and more in the 21st century. Listen, my friends, we, we don't have to deny what we're going through, but neither do we have to give in to the pressures of this world. Don't have to deny it, but don't have to give in to it either. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says this, But we have this treasure. How many of you know the treasure is the Holy Spirit? We have this treasure in earthen vessels, or maybe your translation says jars of clay. In earthen vessels, the excellency of the power being from God and not from ourselves. We might be troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And always carrying around in the body the death of the Lord Jesus, that also the life of Jesus might be expressed in our bodies. For we who, for we who would live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That also the life of Jesus might be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death works in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith as it is written, I believed. And therefore I have spoken. So we also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us through Jesus and will present us with you. And all these things are for your sakes. So that the abundant grace through the thanksgiving of many might overflow to the glory of God. For this reason we do not lose heart. Someone say we do not lose heart. Our light afflictions which last but for a moment works for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things in which are not seen are eternal. Who knows that this life is just temporal? Who knows that the things that I'm going through are just temporary? Even if you Pastor, I've been suffering for years. It's still just temporary. There's eternal glory. For the saints of God. For those that believe. Let us stay grounded in this my friend. No matter what may come our way. The Holy Spirit is within us. And he will sustain us. Through it all. We will come through to the other side. And have a great testimony to share. With those around us. I, we've told our testimonies so many times. Here and around that. Han and I have, but one of the things that we will always hold near and dear was the testimony that the Lord gave us through healing our youngest daughter when she was hit with a car. It's, it's so many years ago, it's still just as plain as day, but we were struggling. We were hurting. We, hang, we hung on to each other and looked to God. We said, Lord, help us through this process. Holland and I were basically by ourselves in, in Germany. We were in Tier uh, West Germany at the time. There was a children's hospital there. And I'll never forget the doctor telling us that if she, Tammy didn't recover, she'd already been in the hospital several weeks, he said if Tammy didn't recover by Monday, this was on a Friday evening, he said if she doesn't recover by Monday or get better by Monday, then we're going to have to go in and do radical surgery where we'll have to remove a portion of her small intestine and put something in there to help her system open up how many of you know no one wants to hear that about your little baby daughter no one wants to hear that Han and I took our Bible we were by ourselves at that time 
We, were, we didn't have family around. We were in Germany. We had just arrived, and we hadn't been there very long. We took our Bible, and we went into the room, and we did what our Pentecostal forefathers had done for forever, it seems like. We prayed over her. And I read this scripture to her. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a lame man from birth was being carried, whom people placed daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter, glancing at him with John, said, Look at us! So he paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And I looked Tammy in the face and I said, Daddy can't take the pain away. I can't put myself in your place. I would gladly, but I cannot. So what I give to you, I give the only thing that I have to give. And we laid hands on her and prayed and believed that God would heal her. On Monday morning, they took her to x-ray. They told me they wouldn't do that unless there was a miracle. When I came in on Monday, she was at x-ray. We went down and they picked up the x-ray and showed it to Han and I. And the place that was closed in her bowel was completely open. As God healed her from that accident. Somebody shout amen. Amen. I have a testimony. I have a testimony of the miracle working power of God. I have a testimony of his hand as he moves across people's hearts and lives. I have a testimony of how he delivered and set me free. I've been saved by the blood of the lamb. Anyone else have a testimony? If you do, give the Lord praise in the house today. My second point is be real. Be real about who's running the universe. Be real about who's running the universe. Jesus is Lord. Can I say that again? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my Deliverer. He is my one and all. He is who I put my hope in. He is who I put my trust in. He is my God. Jesus is Lord. And that's what the Bible teaches us. The question is settled. When Jesus rose from the dead, I tell you this morning that God has power over life and death. My question for us this morning is how are we responding to that message? Is he alive today? If he's alive, give the Lord a clap off and a praise. It will bring down the roof. Do we really respond to the fact that Jesus is running the universe? And we are his. I love the prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes, you give the Lord another clap off and praise if you'd like. Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe that God does desire to pour his blessing upon his children. Listen to Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. There are benefits. There are benefits to a deep, deep love relationship with Jesus Christ. Who can name a few? Who can name a few? What are the benefits of a deep, deep love relationship with Jesus Christ? Just shout it out. Eternal life. Eternal life. Somebody else. Peace. 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 Somebody else. Joy. Joy. Somebody else. Strength. Strength. Did I hear that correct? Strength. What else? Forgiveness. What else? Hope. Hope. What else? Say it again. He heals. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Glory be to his name. Anybody need healing in the house? Call upon the name of Jesus and watch as he heals your body and sets you free. Somebody else. What are the benefits from a deep, deep love relationship with Jesus Christ? 
This is your opportunity to shout at the pastor. So I didn't hear it. Knowledge. Knowledge. Amen. The knowledge of Christ. He takes care of us. He takes care of us. Amen. Wisdom. Wisdom. Is there any end? Peter says, you are blessed. If you're blessed at Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, raise a hand, maybe two, towards the sky. If you are blessed, raise a hand. <laughs> you, say, you say, Pastor, you just don't know what I've been through. You don't understand where I'm at. You don't understand the struggles that I'm going through. If that Jew raised both hands towards the sky. And let the Lord know that you are blessed beyond measure. Because no matter how hard things get, He is still Je he, Jehovah is still Jehovah. God is still God. And in Him I find everything that I need. All hope, all glory, all power, all understanding and all knowledge. I need Him above all things. Oh, I want to know Him. Lord, fill me with your knowledge. Fill me with wonderful understanding. Give me divine wisdom that comes straight from heaven. Make me complete. Anybody else? Anyone else? Anybody else? Listen, even if you're suffering, you're still blessed. <laughs> I know somebody's going to say, oh, pastor. Listen, my friends. The the priority, the focus, the thing that you're looking at, the most important thing can't be the struggle. It can't be the suffering. I, listen, I'm not blessed with my suffering. I am blessed in my suffering because Jesus Christ walks with me every step of the way. He is with me. Woo, the boy preaches, he is with me. No matter where I may go, He is with me. It's a principle well worth learning. In God's economy, suffering brings us into a closer walk with God. What a blessing. Romans 5, 3. Not only so, but we also boast in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces patience, patience produces character, character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The alternative to a life of blessing in the midst of pain is spelled out in the text is a life of fear. Listen to me this morning, Angle Lake Neighborhood Church. There is no reward in a life full of fear. But I tell you this, there is hope in the Holy Spirit. I don't put my hope and trust in my fear. I put my hope and trust in God, the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I cannot overcome my fear. I cannot overcome my pain. This is where Jesus comes into the picture and says, Seek first my righteousness. Run after me. Put your sights right on me. Throw your fear and your pain right up on my shoulders. Come and rest in my arms. Let me comfort you in your fear and pain because I have a great blessing for you. And the blessing could very well be just a closer relationship with Jesus. I need a closer relationship with Jesus. When you love the Lord... Your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. When He is number one in your life, it leads to a wholeness and a fulfillment to life. When loving God is our priority in life, we will seek out ways to learn His Word. We will learn what the Bible teaches. We will involve ourselves in thinking through current issues based on the teaching of the Bible. Who hears what I'm saying? Who hears what I'm saying? I, I don't care what anyone else in the world is doing. I put my hope and trust in God, and I put my hope and trust in God's Word. Amen. Not in something someone else can do. You don't even put your trust in Pastor John. Somebody shout a big amen. amen. You put your hope and trust in God and in His Word. Now, you still love me. Well, I, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Is Mike the only one here today? I'm, When loving God is our priority, 
We will seek out ways to learn His Word. We will learn what the Bible teaches. We will involve ourselves in thinking through current issues based on the teaching of the Bible. So make sure your heart is in the right place. Make sure your heart is in the right place. No one, no pressure can take Him away from you if He is in your heart. My next point is, be ready. Be ready. As family and friends watch you, they will see how you respond to things that happen in your life. It is here that every one of us knows what it is that we believe and how we should behave. Behavior. Behavior. We must be ready in spirit and deed. By our character, it will help others see that the faith we live in is the right way above all others. Do you have the character of Christ in you? Are you displaying that for the world to see? Or does the world see in you something different? The world is watching. If you say I'm a Christ follower, I guarantee you the world is watching. Everything you do, every step you take, every word that comes out of your mouth. And listen, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. But we at least have to be holy. <laughs> Someone just went, what? You say, I, I don't have to be perfect, but I have to be holy. Did you know that you can walk in holiness? You can. No one of us could ever be perfect. We will always make mistakes. But we are told we can walk in holiness. How, what does that look like? I put everything that I have on Jesus and I let God be the one who covers me. My righteousness is as filthy rags, isn't it? But his righteousness is pure and holy and glorious. And the word of God says he covered me in not my righteousness. Jesus took my righteousness to the cross and he clothed me with what? His righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Anybody want to see that in your heart and life? There is absolutely nothing that the devil can throw at you that should make you fear or compromise what you believe. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you've been transformed by His precious blood. You've been redeemed. And have your hope in Him. Stand tall and let the world around you know what you believe in. Be ready. Somebody say that with me. Be ready. If you're not involved in a discipleship class, <laughs> I feel like I give a plug for these all the time, but listen, it's important. If you're not involved in a discipleship class, why not? Man, we provide a lot. And if you're watching online, that's wonderful. Let us know. We'd like to know if you're watching online. Bump Pastor Nick, if you would. I'm talking about online. Bump Pastor Nick online. Let him know you're watching. When we are sure about our relationship with God, we can finally take our eyes off of ourselves with no need for self-protection, knowing God will bless no matter what, and at last then start serving others with great love. God's great love. Be ready. Get involved. Be ready. Get involved. And my next point is, do not lose focus. Do not lose focus. Peter offers us the key motivation to keeping our priorities right in a pressure-packed world. And the focus is Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. The focus is Jesus. Look at Him. Follow Him. Keep your focus centered right on Jesus. Jesus gives us a wonderful example of how to react under pressure. He was full of hope, had a gentle spirit, and was reverent before God. What does your calendar look like? Pastor's going to poke for a few minutes here. Pastor's going to get in some business maybe for a few minutes. What is your calendar like? What do you spend most of your time doing? What gets scratched when you have an itch? What gets taken out when you're in a hurry? Does your spouse or your family or church get bumped when your schedule gets full? I don't know if you guys know who Jensen Franklin is, but Jensen Franklin once said that if your kids get up on Sunday morning and ask you, are we going to church today? You need revival. 
Think about that for a minute. By looking at your schedule, it's easy, easy to determine what your priorities are. Many years ago, White House domestic policy advisor Bill Galston resigned his position after receiving a letter from his 10-year-old son. The letter simply said this, Dad, baseball is not fun when there's no one there to applaud you. Mr. Galston told the president, you can replace me, my son can't. Can I get an amen? Sir Francis Adams, a 19th century political figure and diplomat, kept a diary. One day he entered, went fishing with my son today, a day wasted. His son, Brooke Adams, also kept a diary, which is still in existence today. And on that same day, Brooke Adams made this entry, went fishing today with my dad, the most wonderful day of my life. Catch the difference? A complete waste of a day. The most wonderful day of my life. Does your schedule reflect the priorities that are really important? Pull out your checkbook. No. Pull out your bank statement. Take a look at what you spend your money on. Anybody here, would you be embarrassed if you had to show it to the person sitting next to you? Or would you be proud to show that your spending reflects godly priorities? Jesus said, your heart will be where your treasure is. When your budget is tight, then, then what gets cut? Are you living within your income? Are you going into debt if you really want to get your priorities in line? Invest financially in the kingdom of God. If you make financial commitment to give to God first from every paycheck, God is faithful and will provide for your needs. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I ain't going to let you never go to church. In the near future, you're going to get another sermon on tithing, on giving. But I want to just make something real clear. Angle Lake Never Church has always been a wonderful giving church. Always has been. But as people leave, as things change, new faces come in, it's imperative that we communicate to everyone that's a part of this church that we do business as you give, as you give to us. Salaries, bills, utilities, all the things that you see happening around this church happen because the people give. This is not pastor standing before you begging for money. This is pastor standing before you telling you that we survive by the giving of all the individuals in this church. And here's a key that... that, that I think that we have to at least understand. If we can't pay salaries, then people will have to go find places where they can work to get a salary. It doesn't mean that they stop being connected to the church or being a part of the staff, but it means that their hours will be tremendously cut. Who understands what I'm saying? Because they're now going to have to go look for a job. If you're a member of Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, my encouragement to you is... Give to God what is God's. If you're not a member of Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, but you come to church here every week, give to God what is God's. It's a very silly, maybe just a real superficial little example, but you don't go eat at Burger King and pay McDonald's. Burger King's not going to give it to you for free. Who believes God is faithful? Who believes God provides for our needs? Who believes God will provide for your need? When I was pastoring in Oakville, I once had a young man came to see me. I actually had this happen several times when I was in Oakville, but I'll give you this one story. He came to me and he said, Pastor, this was kind of his attitude. Pastor, I'm going to start tithing this week. You've told us the importance of tithing, and I know that tithing is important, so I'm going to start paying the tithe this week. I don't know where the money's coming from, because I don't have it, 
but I'm going to tithe it anyway. So then I had to do a little sermonette on giving thankfully. And I encouraged him to give. It wasn't two weeks went by. He comes into my office with a big smile on his face. says, you're not going to believe what happened. He said, I started tithing and I got a call at the office and I got promoted. Promoted. And check this out. Not only does my promotion cover my salary and the bills I have now, but it also provides for the tithe. Who knows God is faithful all the time. God is faithful. I have never, and all the, Holland and I have been married for 46 years. We've been in the church almost that long. We've never been able to outgive God. Not once. He's always provided. He always will. Somebody shout amen. amen. But as a lesson subject today, capture this. We need everyone to give to God what belongs to God. If you believe that's accurate and true, give the Lord a clap offering of praise in this house this evening. Another thing that we have to understand is what is it that we talk about? What topics occupy our conversations? When you get really excited and just need to tell somebody, what is it that you're really excited about to tell them? For out of the overflow of the heart, Scripture tells us, the mouth speaks. Another way to put it is this way. Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. The eyes may be the window to the soul, but it is your words that are the living room and that the person looks through those windows into. Through our words, what do people see? What are you like when no one else is around? What do you think about? Who are you when no one is looking? Having the wrong priority in life is much like buttoning a coat incorrectly. Who's ever seen the person that's come out of the room with their shirt buttoned and they've got the buttons in the wrong place anyone ever seen that before anyone want to confess that i resemble that remark on occasion the buttons are lined up in the wrong place do you know what a shirt looks like with the buttons in the wrong place it doesn't look very neat does it who believes we need to get lined up according to what the scripture tells us to do who believes we need to get all the buttons in the right place? If the worship team will start making their way back. I have a rather long quote from David Wilkerson that I want to read to you. A rather long quote. So bear with me if you will. A priority is the importance you place on something. And Christians who neglect prayer have perverted their priorities. Many believers pledge that they'll pray if and when they can find time. Each, yet each week, seeking Christ becomes less important to them than washing the car, cleaning the house, visiting friends, eating out, going shopping, watching sports. They simply don't make time to pray. Yet, people were no different in the days of Noah and Lot. Their top priorities were eating and drinking, buying and selling, marrying and caring for their families. They had no time to listen to the message of God, of God's coming judgment. And so no one was prepared when judgment fell. Nothing has changed over the centuries. For most Americans, God remains at the bottom of the priority list and at the top are income, security, Pleasure, family, of course, for most Americans, God doesn't even make the list. But that, doesn't, but that doesn't grieve the Lord nearly as much as how little he's valued by his own children. There's an old, old song, and I'll try to sing it for you, but there's an old, old song. I, was, I think I was a kid when I first heard this. And it's an interesting song in that it speaks from like God is talking and God is asking simply, what's wrong with my children? What's wrong with my children? Why won't they praise me? Am I not the king of kings? 
Am I not the Lord of Lords? What's wrong with my children? Why don't they praise me? I've given them everything, yet they have no joy. Did I not row back the sea? Suffer on Calvary. I'm Alpha Omega, the beginning and end. And though I supply their need, oh, they seldom talk to me. What's wrong with my children? Am I not their Lord? They assemble in my name and sing of their love for me. But their song's not of the heart, and I can't hear them sing. Are they ashamed of me, afraid someone might see? If they lift their hands towards heaven above, in honor of me, what's wrong with my children? Why won't they praise me? Am I not the King of kings? Am I not the Lord of lords? What's wrong with my children? Why don't they praise me? I've given them everything, yet they have no joy. It's really a song of indictment, isn't it? What's wrong? What's wrong that we can't praise Him? What's wrong that we can't worship Him? Are these words right? Is He the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? Are these declarations right that He will supply my needs? Are these declarations right that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords? If all this declaration is correct, what kind of people ought we to be? Is David Wilkerson right? Are the people that he calls his own children, do they value him less than all? All heads bowed just for a moment and every eye closed just for a moment. You hear this morning, you say, you know, pastor, you're right. My, my priorities have just not been right. My priorities are off base. I have not sought the face of God like I should. I've given lip service. Would you pray for me? I want, I want prayer this morning. Is that you? Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see those. Yes, I see those hands. Yes. Hallelujah, Lord God, Lord God. Father, I pray over every hand that was raised. Help us, I pray this morning, Father the Lord. Help us to have the right priorities. Help us to be people that are seeking your face, focused on who you are. And Father the Lord will not get tied up into who I think I should be. Help us with our behaviors, Father the Lord God. Deliver us and set us free from fear. Reach down your loving hand this very moment and help us to be the people that you desire for us to be. And I give you all thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Sing as the worship team leads us.